is the May committee meeting on housing construction and community development. And um, the Commissioner Rubin is on his way, so I think we'll do the bills first and then we can uh, go into our discussion with him. Uh, I do have voting sheets from Thank Senator you. Panapinto, Senator Abella, Senator Bonasek, Senator Young, and Senator Galvan. And I'm joined by Senator Espiage, Senator Kruger, Senator Boyle, and thank you for coming. Uh, the first bill on our calendar is Senate Bill 3204 by Senator Goldberg. An act to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to the disclosure of information provided in the notice to the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development by a mortgagee commencing an action to recover residential real property. Any discussion? I didn't understand why we would want to exempt this information from FOIA law. What's the purpose? Um, I would imagine that sometimes they're working on, you know, not foreclosing. They're doing a workout on their mortgage or something rather than having people be able to get their information and banking information and all of that. Right. I thought this was specific to foreclosure. This it bill. is, and it's really the provision of confidentiality as I understand it from the sponsor. However, the information could be disclosed um, to a housing counseling agency if we wanted to try and prevent someone from entering into foreclosure. But I believe that the intent is really just the provision of confidentiality in foreclosure proceedings. Yeah, it's before the foreclosure actually takes place, I think. Right. So. And has there been some, I guess, examples or concerns about people getting the information inappropriately using FOIL? Not that have been relayed to us or that, you know, we certainly can follow up with Senator Goldman and uh -huh. get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah, I just, I'm not, you know, I don't know that I disagree with it. I just don't understand why we would need to exempt certain um, activities from FOIL that are already under FOIL. So I'm going to go with that route. Well, I think sometimes when people get involved in a foreclosure, um, they're trying to get out of it and it's necessary to let other people know they're going through a foreclosure at that time. So people well, foiling would be, I don't know. Although the foiling that. could also be against the, to collect information from the um, entity that was pursuing the foreclosure, not the household loop in foreclosure. So there's been so many incidents of um, banks and others bringing foreclosure actions where when you go through the process, you actually discover they don't even have the paperwork that rightfully justifies their ability to foreclose. That's been a real pattern. And so if the intent is to prevent people from getting information prior to going into the foreclosure process, um, to document that actually there's not a real case against them. Um, that would be my concern. That we don't want to limit the ability of people to get this information as early as possible. Because you don't want to end up in a courtroom saying, but I think they don't even have the basis to foreclose on me and to be the starting gun when you're already in the court. So it, it does have the exemption for somebody who's working with a counseling mm -hmm. service. Mm -hmm. So I do recognize that, but there are also people who end up <coughs> in a courtroom trying to prevent themselves from being foreclosed upon that aren't working with a counseling service. So okay. I would hate to be, I hate to be supporting a law that limits my, my ability to get information that might be helpful to me to prevent a foreclosure on my home mm -hmm. uh, because somehow I didn't have a FOIL right. So that's why I'm going to go with that rack and talk to Senator Paul. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, make a motion. Okay. okay thank you. Um, any negative votes? All right, the bill is passed. And we welcome Commissioner Rubin. Thank you, sir. We only have three bills. Thank we you, did the first one. Anything you need to do. There's a lot of traffic, I know. So. Um, Senate Bill 4571 by Senator Rosa. An act to the public housing law in relation to requiring that the New York City Housing Authority include a notice informing a prospective tenant or tenant of the ability to add legal occupants to the lease or renewal lease and provide upon request a tenant with a form to add additional legal occupants. Any discussion? Uh, no. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Negative votes? The bill is passed. And Senate Bill 7637 by me, and it is to be referred to finance. 
an act in relation to redistributing 2014 bond volume allocations made pursuant to Section 146 of the Federal Tax Reform Act of 1986, allocation of the unified state bond volume ceiling, and enacting the Private Activity Bond Allocation Act of 2016, and providing for the repeal of certain provisions upon expiration thereof. Any discussion? Good bill. Okay, thank you. Um, all those in favor? Aye. <coughs> Any negative votes? All right, the bill will go to finance. And it's really my honor and pleasure to uh, have uh, Commissioner Rubin here with us today. We have a lot of things going on as we get towards the end of the session. And um, we've talked before, but I'd um, love to hear from him on some of the things they're doing. Thank you, Senator. So I'll be um, quick. I brought some <coughs> remarks, um, but um, <coughs> I, I think the idea is to keep this informal. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I assume you know everyone. Uh, I Senator Espeon, Senator Kruger, and Senator Boyle. Absolutely. And Nicola. Yeah, Nicola. And you know Lori. Of course. Um, He's a constituent, but I don't have to be nice. I am. It's true. <laughs> yeah, I've held off on all the complaints so far. I'm nice was, to all my constituents. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she has more than you do. <laughs> um, uh, so um, it's been a busy. I've, I've been here almost a year, um, and it's been a busy. Uh, it's been a busy year, as you know. Um, I spent. The, I think you know this, but I spent the prior two years mostly. Um, as executive director of the governor's office of storm recovery, and for County Senator Boyle, we had a lot of interaction about how the storm recovery was going for his constituents, and I think it's, I'm sure there's still, I know there are still issues, but I think it's gone relatively well. Um, uh, over time, we've closed, just to give you a couple of quick points of update, um, the single family housing program is the most visible and most active uh, of the storm recovery programs, most of which is on Long Island. Um, and we have to date closed. We had about 11, we have about 11,000 single family homeowners um, who we will ultimately help with funds for their uh, for repair and rehabilitation of their homes. Um, out of about 20,000 who applied, we lost about a 9,000 along the way, mostly because of ineligibility for various reasons. We have closed out over 4,000 at this point. So 4,000 people came into the process, got money from us, repaired their homes, elevated their homes, whatever, are closed out, and they'll never hear from us again. Um, and we're doing that at about two to three hundred a month at this point. Um, so, and the pace is held up over a long period of time. It wasn't a blip. So, we really are. Uh, I mean, obviously, everybody would like things to move faster, but we project that by the end of this year, we'll have well over five thousand um, who are closed out. And after that, you know, some are difficult cases, and some are the really easy cases which just started late. And so, we expect that we'll be finished, uh, finished with that part of the recovery in a really relatively timely fashion. We've spent almost two billion dollars on that part of the, uh, on that part of the recovery, closing in on two billion dollars. Um, there have been reports about, you know, in the city, obviously, New York City has its own activity in that regard. Um, and there have been reports about how much they're spending on their own, uh, on individual home elevations and so forth. And just so you have a, you probably sure you have a close eye on the bottom line, we haven't spent anything like that. There were reports of six, seven hundred, eight thousand, eight hundred thousand dollar home elevations, and we've um, stayed long below that. So, sorry, I, it's, my, it's my first involvement in state government, it's still passion. So, um, uh, we have done a lot in the last uh, in the last year. We've overhauled the senior management ranks of the um, of the uh, of the agency. Betsy Mallow is behind me. Uh, is one of my deputies. Jeff Betsy's uh, deputy in charge of um, uh, housing preservation, and she's also the agency's chief operating officer, and has made I think substantial operating improvements um, at the agency. Amy Frioli, of course, is our um, is our head of director of government relations. Um, we have a new deputy, Ruth Ambusnauskas, who many of you have met, um, who was Mayor Bloomberg's last head of the Housing Preservation Depo Development Department at, um, at the city. She's now in charge of all those activities for the state, which is a huge thing. Um, we have a new general counsel, Adam Schumann, uh, who came from the private sector, who has sort of unified the internal legal operations and so on. So um, it's been a pretty, uh, and now we're, we're moving down the ranks. So we've sort of done some reorganization to make the agency more user-friendly to the developer community, um, and we're going to continue our focus on that um, over the next few years. Um, what else have I done? Um, you know, the agency's usual set of activities obviously continues. Um, we've made, we've had two record-breaking years in a row in terms of development funds out. Um, interestingly, if I had to make a couple of quick observations about that, 
um, we we looked at our pipeline. We looked at our pipeline. We sort of we've instituted a lot of uh, internal management um, that wasn't there before, and we do a lot of pipeline review to make sure we understand what we're doing right now, what the timeline is for development projects, and what we have coming up, so we can give people the ability to plan. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we looked at our pipeline from April to June, what our activity was from April to June of last year, and where we are right now, which is the April, June, April, July pipeline piece. Um, and the upstate activity um, was much more robust this time around than it was the last time. Um, and that's due largely to um, our uh, a lot of work that our team has put in in developing the ability upstate, outside of what I call upstate, uh, outside of New York City. Rest North of the Yonkers. North of the Yonkers, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, using the, the bonds. So traditionally, out of outside of New York City, affordable housing development has largely been either grants or federal tax credits, what we call the 9%. Um, and bonds have been, they're a little more complicated to use. Um, you tend to do it with larger projects. It takes, it, like anything else, I mean, it's, it's not any more complicated or less complicated, but you just have to develop expertise <coughs> in an area. And the agency started um, educating the developer community a couple of years ago and ramped that up when we realized, look, the low income housing tax credits are a very finite resource. They haven't grown in a while. Um, so if we're going to do, we're going to do more work outside the city, people are going to have to use the bonds, which are a much larger resource than I am cap. That worked. We did this, uh, this time period last year, we were doing two projects in bond, with bonds. This year we have at least 13 that we're going to be doing uh, by the end of July, and it's a huge, huge difference. Um, and it's you know it's a couple thousand affordable units uh, throughout the out of state, the out of city. And of course, it makes available probably more low income housing, or you know it, it frees up the low income tax credits for use across the state, including in the city where they are also much needed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not, it's not the disadvantage; just means basically an expansion of resources. So it's really encouraging. Um, uh, we'll come back to the departmental bills in a second, um, but just to add a couple of things about the outside of New York City activity. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time as Senator Little and I talked about um, traveling throughout the state. I am a New York City kid. I grew up, I grew up in Senator Kruger's district, around the corner from where I live now, um, and uh, and I've expanded my horizons substantially. Um, I've, seen it, I've spent the last year or so traveling around all over the place, not just Albany, but in Rochester several times, at Syracuse, Troy, Amsterdam, um, been all over the North Country, with the Southern Tier, with the Center Young, um, uh, and each of those places have been, Buffalo has been a lot of time, each of those places have been repeat. And it's been, um, it's been extraordinary to see the, um, the impact that our work has um, in the rest of the state, where I think affordable housing, um, the needs are, are equally great as they are in New York City, which gets a lot more attention from the press um, and from the sort of the public at large. They just look a little bit different. <coughs> Senator, Young, Senator uh, Little and I have talked about this a lot. Smaller buildings or mobile homes or mm -hmm. you know senior housing or whatever it is, it may look a little bit different, but it's uh, the needs are enormous. Needs are great, Absolutely. Yeah. I was surprised when I have a Mitchell Lama project, and it's probably about 30 miles from the Canadian border. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. So that's really upstate. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and so that's been, uh, you know, we do a tremendous amount of our work in these areas. Um, and, and unlike in New York City, where there are other resources, there's you know, New York City Housing Authority, but I think it hasn't been, it's HPD and HTC, and a big developer community and an enormous private market. When we work in even a smaller city like Troy or Syracuse or, um, or Buffalo, we're the only source of financing, the only source of public financing with very small exceptions. Um, and so our work is, um, is absolutely critical, and we get enormous local support. The developer community is equally sophisticated as the developer community in New York City, in some cases more so, because they really had to scrap for their resources. Um, you know, a deal that, that they put together in uh, Amsterdam um, has 10 different sources of financing, and they've had to, you know, it takes two years to stitch it together. And it's the only deal that gets done there in that two years. You know, New York City is Senator Kruger now. <coughs> You, know, you walk around the corner and every other building um, had some kind of public subsidy at some point, um, which is great, but it's just a different, it's a different thing. Um, so that, uh, that has, that increased awareness on my part and, the, and um, understanding of where the needs are um, throughout the state fueled our, um, fueled the governor's health fuel, the governor's um, announcement back in January of uh, uh, his housing plan which, as you know, is now um, just awaiting the signing of an MOU by the Senate, the Assembly, and the Governor. Um, you know, I spent a fair amount of time talking to the staff here. They've been terrific. 
um, about what the governor's priorities are. Um, we've, I think, we've had some reasonable initial discussions. They asked a lot of terrific questions, not surprisingly. And, um, and so we have, I think, a reasonable dialogue, same thing on the assembly side. Um, there's obviously, there seems to be a lot that's, a lot of issues that are getting wrapped into this that maybe are not directly related to the MOU. But I know that we're, we are, and the governor is optimistic that we can get all of this done. Um, although it's not directly tied to the legislative session, obviously it's a lot easier if it happens before mm. the end of the legislative session. Well, it is, you know. Yeah. Everybody has a building season. Yeah. And upstate's a lot shorter than it is elsewhere. For sure, <laughs> absolutely. So, um, you know, our agency is ready to do whatever we need to do to, um, to push this across the line. Um, we, have, uh, we have lots of, I think, good internal thinking about what the needs are and how to meet them. Um, I am 100% uh, confident that there is this much difference between what the, at least as far as I understand, what the, um, the, uh, the desires of the assembly are as they were reflected in their one house back in the budget time, um, the needs and desires of the Senate to the extent that, that we've had the opportunity to talk to you about them. Things like middle income, for example, which I know are critical to uh, to you and to Senator Young and to, and to others, um, particularly as you get outside of New York City. Um, those are, those are um, you know, we've, we have figured into our planning a couple hundred million dollars from middle income, which will be um, a tremendous boost um, and way beyond what the state has ever put into middle income housing. So things like that, we're eager to get moving. Um, and and stand ready to you know do one of those horrible budget type marathon sessions whenever you ask us to start doing it. I must leave a bag in the car. And <laughs> um, Jim, but, what's your definition yeah. of middle income for this purpose? Uh, well, you know we have two. With slick uh, it goes I think up to 120, but slick is very limited. And so what we've tried to do is craft a middle income subsidy that would give people the ability to go um, sometimes beyond up to as high as 130 in limited amounts. So we try to make it a little bit more flexible. What's the bottom range? Uh, well, I mean, the bottom would be you know, as low as 60. So <coughs> 60 to 130 60 would to 130 be your definition. Senator, I'll get you a better answer on that. And, and in general terms, what are the governor's priorities in the MOU process? In the MOU, just in terms of what we'd like to get accomplished. So. Um, you can actually see, you found it's got to see John Broderick in the back, who's um, one of the leaders of the, uh, what's been a very effective campaign for uh, for senior housing. So senior housing is absolutely a priority. Um, although we, we do a fair amount of senior housing already, but we're prepared to, to uh, <coughs> carve out a specific <coughs> subsidy for five years. Because I think it's important, again, that people understand, developer community, understand what they have available to them. Um, so uh, certainly a couple hundred million dollars for senior housing, which I think would go a long way. Obviously, supportive housing, which um, I think everybody has been led to understand is an important piece of the solution statewide to the homeless crisis and the special needs homeless crisis. I'm sure special needs, supportive special housing, needs. Right. exactly. Um, uh, and that's probably 850 to a billion dollars of new subsidy to get 6,000 units statewide developed. The very expensive units, and and, uh, and it's just you know, that's, that's that is. Um, uh, we have a fair amount of money we want to spend just on basic new construction and preservation, probably as much as a billion dollars of subsidy for that, again, statewide. Um, middle income, I mentioned, probably $200 million in subsidy over five years. Mitchell Lama, uh, we already have a carve out for Mitchell Lama from some of the settlement money from the last few years, and that's, um, we have, I think, 35 state owned or state managed um, Mitchell Lama program, uh, properties. Uh, that the governor committed to redeveloping or to refinancing um, a couple of years ago. We've done, I think, half of them. Um, so we have enough in our existing budget to do some more, but we've added enough to get through the rest of the program quickly because they are these are 40, 50 year old projects, and some of them are really mm, not just limited to state owned properties. Then. No, yeah, they're not state owned. I said they're sort of state overseen. State, state, state yeah, exactly. And, um, we hope to do some work with public housing authorities, in particular, upstate public housing authorities, which again not New York City. Um, I know NYCHA itself is an issue that that, um, that people will take up <coughs> levels that don't involve me. But um, the rest of the state has an enormous public housing authority uh, population. And um, almost all of those authorities are in severe financial crisis, just like NYCHA, just for the same reasons. Um, you know, the federal government has basically stopped, largely, since Senator Herbert has largely gotten out of the game of um, of supporting the public housing. Um, and so over the years, you've got tremendous built up um, uh, deferred maintenance. And you know, in most places, these are just like NYCHA, these are, this is the housing for low-income families 
of last resort. Um, you know, NYCHA is, I think, what is it, three, four hundred thousand, four hundred thousand residents, yeah. I mean, really, six hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Four million or whatever, however right. many people happen to be living there on any given right. day. Um, and it's the same thing if you go up to Buffalo or Troy or Amsterdam or Rochester or any of these places in Albany. Um, and so, and the what, one thing that the federal government has done is they've put in place this program called RAD, and we spent some time talking to Lori and uh, uh, your staff about this. Um, they've made it possible if, if to refinance using non federal, non state dollars um, to bring in private capital. Refinance. It's, it's mislabeled privatization of the public housing. It's not, but it sort of gets them out of the public housing rubric. Um, keeps everybody in place, but allows them to bring in private capital using developers. Um, it needs a little bit of subsidy to get that going, and we're hoping to use some of that for um, for some of these outside of New York City public housing. But that would artists. still remain mainly a federal project. It's a, it's well, it depends. Um, it is still a federal project, but it's not a federal. They typically they leave. They they are no longer technically public housing. <coughs> And so you can sort of use some free up some of the restrictions that make it difficult to uh, to invest because I mean there just simply isn't enough public capital to keep mm -hmm. public housing authorities ahead of the maintenance backlog. Um, we are also working with NYCHA to do a rad deal um, that we're hoping to get done sometime late this year with volume cap, um, and that would be probably a couple hundred million dollars of, of uh, taxes and bonds, and be a huge deal for them. So again, so public housing authorities um, substantial amount of subsidy. Um, a small building program, which we've talked about, which is particularly valuable upstate, North Country, places like that, um, where bond bond deals really don't work. Um, you can do nine percent deals, but you need a lot of subsidy, uh, and so sort of twenty to twenty units, fifteen units, things like that, mm -hmm. is you know is all that you need in a lot of these areas. But they're critically important housing, mm -hmm. and we've never had a specific program for that kind of deal. We are going to be able to watch that. So those are a few of the those are a few of our priorities. Jamie, the only area that you <coughs> maybe didn't talk as much about are um, the home ownership area. So. Oh, so uh, well, a couple of things. So as you know, yeah, that's right. No, so Sony May, obviously, we have a big um, we have Sony May, the mortgage, the single family mortgage agency, um, which um, provides subsidized loans to low income first time home buyers, and we're going to continue that activity. We do about at this point about three hundred million dollars a year of those mortgages. Um, and we're we've, we're seeing a lot of demand still. Um, we're obviously going to keep investing in that uh, in that program. We also do uh, homeowner grants and rehab grants through HC and some of our other grant programs. And then we're hoping to launch a um, and this goes to one of the departmentals actually um, a uh, foreclosed properties purchase program. We are using some settlement money that we already have to start the neighborhood revitalization program, which is sort of a tweaked Sony May. To get out of the, to to uh, provide rehab grants and um, and subsidize mortgages to people who buy um, foreclosed or distressed homes um, at, at subsidized rates, and we're hoping to go out and buy um, uh, foreclosed properties by buying the mortgages, or buying the notes from HUD, uh, FHA, and then do the same thing, um, you know, package them with a rehab grant or whatever. Um, and maybe a mortgage and get those homes back on the market, get them back on the tax rolls for the places that they, um, the places in Long Island is a huge, you know, the zombie home crisis is a huge problem. Um, and they're just, you know, when folks walk away, they're not paying the taxes, obviously, so we want to make sure that they come back on um, and get back in, restore, restore them, restore the neighborhoods, et cetera. So, in, oh, no, no, go ahead. That was actually one of the questions I was going to ask you about whether you were exploring that. And some of these foreclosed homes, the the ex owner is still living there. Yes. Will this program provide for some mechanism to support their attempt to rebuy at a different rate if the state is holding the foreclosed home ownership? Or um, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I mean, you can sort of see what the problems might be if if it's somebody who. You know, there's a there's a um, there's a moral hazard issue, right? If somebody walks away from a mortgage but continues to live there, you give them a chance to buy back. Oh, they may have failed to pay their mortgage because yeah. they got walked into a bad mortgage originally. Absolutely. The banks refused to negotiate <coughs> with them, even though there were all kinds of high level laws saying they were supposed to. Look, I think I think what you're really asking is is would we talk about doing principal reduction or loan loan mods? And the answer is yes. 
Um, I mean, those kinds of things in the homeowner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things like um, like what Christy Peel does. We absolutely would be happy to work, and we give grants for for those kinds of organizations. Okay. So we'd absolutely do that. We're not wedged to the idea of buying it and then reselling it on the open market. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, sure. Hey, uh, one question on that, and I realize it's. You, you, I'm sorry. One thing. Well, you have to be a qual. You'd have to be a qualifying. I mean, if we're going to use Sony May, you have to be a qualifying Sony May borrower, which would be a little bit challenging if you're not. So you have to be first time for Sony May. You, you usually do have to be first time. In this case, we do. If I guess we're just doing a bond. <coughs> You probably wouldn't be a new. More. I don't know. I need to find out whether that office is a new okay. mortgage or not. I would. Exactly. We can get there. Okay. We can get there. Sorry, Sam. Uh, one of the uh, um, we just had a forum on it last week uh, regarding the zombie homes, and it is it is a huge issue. Absolutely. Uh, and I know it's not just your area; it's law enforcement and any other sure. things involved. But one thing we see a lot of is uh, these fake leases, where um, the a realtor will put something print something out on the internet. You know, the house is abandoned, they know it's a zombie home, the foreclosure process has been going on and on. Uh, the poor people say, hey, here's, here's, take $5,000, down payment, first month, last month. That per the person who gave them the lease is gone, uh -huh. and the, the squatters are victims, but they're also breaking the law. Wow. Um, so, I mean, we'd like to work with you on this, because it's Absolutely. becoming more and more frequent. So, so this, uh, that's like the, the, the flavors of law breaking yeah. are really yeah. just... Uh, <laughs> and, and, and it's unfortunate, we, we have some towns in our, my area, that are very aggressive. They'll give a summons certainly to the to the homeowner, yeah. the, the original homeowner, the the fake landlord if they can find them, they're probably gone, and this and the, the family that's living there, you know. And I had a, I just got to have a case in my district. Family went on vacation for two weeks. They came back. <laughs> the husband had to continue on his business trip, a business trip. So the wife came home. Yeah. She gets at the house and another family living there. Moved all their stuff into the garage. She calls the cops, of course, and the cop, they show, no, this is the lease. lease. And the cop said, civil matter, can't, can't deal with it, leaves. Wow. And this woman's out of her house for months. She has still not back in. That's extraordinary. But that's what we're looking at. That's I mean, crazy. It's an extreme situation, but there's a lot of abandoned homes where the people just can't, move in. Can't they go after the realtor? I was a realtor. The realtor. Well, well, the realtor, it was, it was a fake lease. You know, it wasn't a real realtor. They just said, oh, here's the lease, you know, uh, here's the house. It wasn't even a real realtor. Yeah. No, of course. Yeah, they made it up. Yeah, that's crazy. Airbnb on steroids. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> that's right. It's a good question. Let me see what the mask around to when we can. In the whole foreclosure thing, New York State is like the sixth longest, yeah. worst foreclosure process in the country. Yeah. And really, a, a good solution would be to be able to expedite that foreclosure process somewhat. Well, I think there is a, um, I believe that there's a DFS departmental bill, which I guess <coughs> wouldn't be here, but um, uh, where that does, I don't know if it addresses the, the foreclosure process directly, but there are some pieces of it that I think are designed to get to that. Um, I know that you all, um, I think I just heard you actually send this over to finance, um, want to set up this community reinvestment fund. Is that the bill? Is that, um, I don't know that I've got the right bill mm -hmm. number in here. Um, but it's, a, it's your zombie property foreclosure bill, which we're absolutely supportive of. And we, I think, as I just said, we want to do the same thing. Um, the, the, a couple of, um, one, one, one particular comment I just want to make, and I think it's your bill. Um, set up a, uh, a board of like 27 people or something like that to oversee whatever the process would be. Am I talking about the real bill? But it's, it's, a, it's a Savino bill. The Savino bill, okay. Savino okay. Savino. okay. 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 But it okay. was in your one house budget. Yeah, that's exactly right. right. Which, uh, you know, which seems, um, you know, if you're trying to move something quickly, 27 people seems like it. A lot. Depending on the people, I guess. Um, so I just uh, just a comment on that. But the but the um, the general notion of doing something about foreclosures and zombie properties through that kind of mechanism, we absolutely agree with. Um, other departmentals, just quickly, I think I heard you do actually a couple of these. Seventy four thirteen, the bonding authority bill, obviously is critically important to the agency, um, and so we you know, hope your thank you for your support. If that's where that went. Um, and seventy four twelve is the MIF bill. Have you, did you talk about that one? No, I don't. Okay. So the Sunny Bay Mortgage Insurance Fund, um, which I'm sure you all know, um, we are asking in 7412 to um, allow the fund to invest in Ginny Mays. The fund, uh, it's, a, it's a large fund, and it's um, uh, to date has invested only in treasuries, which return mm -hmm. about as close to zero as you can get, as you all know. Ginny May is slightly better, but the risk profile is exactly the same. Um, and if we can, over time, phase in to, you know, like uh, even just 200 million or something like that, and Ginny Mays away from Treasury, uh, we can put a couple million dollars more um, back into the net. 
on which we can either, you know, improve its risk profile or eventually get that back out to for other purposes. So it's we think it's a it's a riskless way um, to improve the MIPS return just a little bit. Um, and again, it's restricted to Gini We're not trying to get any additional authority of any kind of investing in. Sometimes the controller's or offices had concerns sure. about different kinds of investment strategies, yep. so might just suggest you ask them whether they're going to have an issue. Better to know it before. That's a great point. Later. later. I'm sure. I think we. We did. Okay. All right. Well, that's a great suggestion. Um, and then finally, 7637, which I heard you do, is the uh, is the volume cap uh, allocation bill, and we're obviously strongly supportive of that. So thank you. Um, that's mm -hmm. basically it. Unless there's any other questions, I'm happy to uh, take any other. Anyone else? Talk about anything. Uh, um, there's continuing concerns about um, because of the lack of a functioning computer system um, for people who are trying to get information um, out of the, um, the random administration. Why am I blanking on the random Yeah, you, you got it already. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Thank Absolutely. you. Um, and I'm just wondering, what you know, you had some audits that showed you were pretty slow on the draw, and I'm wondering whether there have been any improvements. Um, I would say there have been improvements. There are internal management improvements that um, Betsy is actually in charge of, um, but the computer system is the same computer system. Um, and has been for, it's got to be coming up like 30 years. The good news is um, we are working with ITS. We, did we issue the RFP? Yeah. We issued the RFP. We issued an RFP when? It's almost, the, the scoring is almost final. Okay, great. So we have bids actually um, for a complete overhaul of that system. Which is terrific. It's a you know obviously a large project, um, and it's it'll take, multiple years, it'll take multiple years, et cetera, et cetera. But by the time it's done, I mean that's what it, it's exactly that that it's going to. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that any of us will be here to see it or even alive. <laughs> but um, but it, it'll be. I mean it's an important step forward. It's exactly to go to exactly the findings of that audit. So. You know, I wish I had walked in the door. That audit covered a period that was not only before me, but well before me. Um, and I wish I had walked in the door to find that, uh, that the overall was already going on, but I didn't, so we stepped up the pace a bit. Yeah, one of the things that when some of the developers, the housing developers, talking about is the cost of building affordable housing and the mandates and the rules and regulations and all, um, making it almost difficult to do. And um, one of the things we had talked about was the up to seven and a half percent and mm -hmm. trying to make it up a flat seven and a half percent for their administrative costs. Yep. Is there any other way to kind of make it more affordable to be able to build affordable housing? Um, well, I mean that's a hard that's a hard question. You know, in, in I mean the biggest components of, of the biggest cost components are um, depending on where you are in New York City obviously it's land cost. Um, and I think the market is going to take care of that over time. We're already seeing it sort of plateau a little bit, but um, but that's you know that's the biggest issue in Long Island a little bit, and then labor. Um, and you know again labor costs. It's a very hot market, particularly in the New York City area at the moment. There's more than enough work to go around of all kinds, and so it's just very expensive to get people to come work on projects. Um, and again, I think that's particularly since we've run a 421A at least for a little while. Um, and the luxury condo market is tailing off, and you know some other things. I think that's also going to start to take care of itself. Outside of New York City, um, you know, costs are lower, obviously. Um, you know, there may be local, you know, zoning and that kind of, that kind of stuff. Kind of yeah, which is not, you know, for the most part, not us. Mm -hmm. um, we have, I mean, we are, we do what we can to control costs simply by working with developers to put cost caps. So we will, when we do scoring, for example, we um, we uh, we will deduct points or not provide points to people who are costs that are over certain, um, you know, what we understand our internal benchmarking to be. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, our view is that controls just because people want government subsidy, they have to keep their costs up. Right. And that's always the, the most difficult negotiation mm -hmm. that we have with the developer. What about your efforts to build uh, <coughs> affordable housing out of that $1.9 billion? Mm -hmm. Are you wedded to a particular model? Do you have like a inclusionary or this outright 100% affordable, what are you doing? No, I mean, we're going to, uh, new construction, you know, we'll, we, 
um, are doing a lot more 100% affordable inside the city than we used to. We're, we're trying to get out of the 80-20 game because that's just a very expensive, inefficient way to build affordable housing in New York City. So, and we are absolutely looking at ways to. I mean, we expect that a lot of our a lot of our units will be, um, you know, low and extremely low income. And you mentioned uh, how much money you foresee will be allocated for senior housing. Um, I think that we we were talking to about senior remember? I wouldn't want to speak, say wrong, but I think it's sort of the 200 million over five years or something like that. And what's the projected number of units like that? Um, <coughs> let me come back to you on that one. Were you talking about it as a program model where it's exclusively senior housing or senior housing priority with mixed residential? You know, we so can do anything. I think it just, again, you know, the way we work is developers come in and, and make uh, proposals to us. I mean, John and I, John Broderick and I have talked about this a lot. The, the, the what would be particularly valuable in the senior housing, we're, we're senior. The piece that's missing in senior housing right now is the services money, um, and that you know our agency doesn't really play in that. Um, but we are eager to provide at least a, a, you know a enough of a subsidy package that if somebody operates efficiently, they can you know add a little bit of money into their services. You know, senior housing, if you're not talking about really intensive special needs senior housing, um, which would fall under other categories. Senior housing, John will correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, you only need, if you need a services coordinator in a, you know, 50 or 100 unit building, that's a hugely valuable add. And it's probably, you know, it's 150,000 a year or something like that. I don't want to lock it down. <coughs> yeah. I'm glad to hear you talking about the importance of linking social services within senior yeah, housing. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. And some senior housing um, needs to be middle income. Absolutely. I mean, you have a lot of retired teachers and public, uh, government workers who still need uh, senior housing. Oh, for sure. They can benefit from it. For sure. The only other thing I wanted to ask about was the the ongoing um, program that's out there right now, getting applications, rolling applications for mm -hmm. money. Yep. Yeah. The, the what? Unified funding. Right, unified funding. I can't keep all these titles straight. <laughs> the, from the December, right. the December yeah. end, yep. Right. Um, we're at a point where we're getting ready to announce them, um, and we've talked a little bit about that. But yeah, no, we've, this is uh, our, our last unified funding round for the 9% so for this OK. So we're, we're very close to being able to announce. Which unit of your department audits and evaluates MCI applications at this time. Oh, all right. Yeah. Okay, so at least for my district, there have been some MCI applications that have gone in that you look at it and you go, are they going to redo the outside of the building with gold bricks? <laughs> well, that's actually, that actually, in our district, that might. That might be. <laughs> <That does laughs> yeah. So MCI is where the calculation is that it will add to the rental cost, $200 per room. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, these are rent regulated people. Right. So if you had a three room apartment, it would be a $600 increase just for the MCI. So I'm just wondering whether you've seen an uptick in your activity to evaluate these or whether there is something you can be doing to help streamline mm -hmm. what my office would call seriously questionable MCI applications. Um, <coughs> I don't know, Betsy, you want to say anything about that? I mean, I don't think, <coughs> sorry, I'm a bit stuffy. I don't, uh, with respect to the number of MCI applications coming in, has there been an uptick? I don't think. No, the, the, the dollar amount they're claiming for rehab. Um, I haven't heard that the average dollar amount is going up. There are mm -hmm. extreme cases, obviously, like, I mean, not gold plated bricks, but one would think that there's, um, as you <coughs> probably know, there isn't anything in the regulation <coughs> that, um, uh, has cost schedules, right? So uh, pending that they are legally compliant investments, um, we evaluate them on the merits. So have you, have you reviewed the whole process? Because it's been, you know, a question, a cloud about the, the veracity of this, you know, the process and whether in fact, you know, <coughs> one roof is done and it costs a hundred thousand dollars argument, and then a similar, an identical move is done as five hundred thousand dollars, and so 
this, the disparity yeah. in cost, right, of major capital improvement trigger has something. triggered a, a questioning that I think uh, warrants uh, a review, an overall review of the process, and maybe looking at the regs and see what can be done. Well, so that's, I mean, I mean I think what, what you're <coughs> suggesting, look, our, the, I mean, we've spent, we've spent a lot of time at the ORA um, with, working with them on their processes, which are complicated. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, if you go and talk to the RSA or to, <coughs> to the landlords, you would, they would tell you that, um, they would ask you, they would ask us to streamline our MCI process too because it takes a long time to process them. Part of the reason for that is there's a, it's essentially a due process driven and an analytics-driven um, uh, process for processing an MCI. You know, they are they do local, they do on-site mm -hmm. inspections, they review receipts and contracts and all that mm -hmm. other stuff. I think the real question is not whether there's fraud in the or you know a, a inaccuracy in the billing, but whether there's benchmarking, right? And I think that's what Betsy was saying. Is we don't have a rule that says I don't think that says you know you can only spend two dollars a square foot on the roof or whatever. You can. But, you know, but the question is, if you're putting in two kinds of roofs mm -hmm. that are two different cost levels. And the elephant in the room is that many perceive the MCI process to be a backdoor way of hiking the rent. And right. so, you know, or even displacing people. Uh, and so the, sometimes when you have these very uh, sort of like awkward or strange uh, investments that uh, seem to be <coughs> high, one could think that this is being done either to hike the rent or maybe to have a turnover in tenants in them. And so there has to be some kind of parameters. Right? We've got one more question from Phil Boyle, and then I don't want to keep you no, all no, morning. No, yeah, just real quick, quick question. One of the things I, I think you're aware of, it, but just so you're, for your own edification, all in my own, I think, I don't like to use the oh, oh, term, but it's like a crisis for housing for our young adults. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the transit already the development TOD where they're building these apartments near the railroad station is booming and it's doing very well. They're still not cheap, you know, but a lot of these uh, young adults coming out of college, they uh, they have, am I going to live in my parents' basement until I'm 35? Uh, is that what they're looking at? And, or move out of state? And so we're lo losing a lot of our youth. So just something for your team to consider. I, I got it. And yeah. we, would we would love to see more, uh, more activity in Long Island. Um, TOD, you're exactly right. TOD is... Um, is probably part of the solution there. Yes, because I think that's yeah, the, I think so. And you know, they get to transit and get into the into the city. Yeah. So we are, I mean, we're active a lot on the budget. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you very, Good. very much. Oh, thank you. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.